but um, just, uh, you know, if you have, I mean, it looks like you got the emails, but we will do this uh, uh, every Thursday night at seven. Uh, we will have uh, special guests. Uh, we will have uh, college designers, uh, college umpires uh, here in the next couple of weeks that will come and, uh, you know, give us uh, a little bit of training on things that uh, we need to get better, guys. Um, and after being on uh, Zooms all week, uh, this is going to work best. I, I think Dana is going to mute everyone, but please mute yourselves. Uh, be respectful for uh, everyone else on the call. Um, on the bottom of your screen, uh, you can. Uh, there's a little microphone that you can mute yourselves. Uh, after uh, Mike is done uh, with his presentation, um, we could ask him a questions one at a time. Um, but uh, uh, thank you guys for being here. And uh, Dana, I'll turn it over back to you. Thanks, Hector. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody right now. And um, then, as Hector said, we will just, uh, you can unmute yourselves when Mr. Everett is done talking. Uh, we do have with us Mike Everett, who, if you were at the NMOA State Clinic a couple of Sorry about that. If you were at the State Clinic a couple of years ago, you will remember he was our guest speaker there. Um, recently, I was posting some stuff about what we were doing in New Mexico with regard to Land Clark being on, who just got promoted to White Hat in the NFL. And Mike actually reached out to me out of the kindness of his heart and asked if he could do a presentation and contribute to New Mexico. Those of you who have heard of Mike or know Mike know that he does come from New Mexico. So the, the land of enchantment is still near and dear to his heart, but it was an unsolicited uh, text message and Twitter message from Mike asking if he could come and join us tonight and help us moving forward as well. So we're gonna look to do some mini clinics with him in the future and uh, get him as involved as we can. I told him we'll, we'll uh, utilize his knowledge and services until he gets sick of us. So I'm uh, super excited. I appreciate his, um, just his humility and his willingness to talk to us and, and to reach out and actually ask if he, if he could help us. That was pretty cool. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mike Everett, who's proudly wearing his NMOA hat and pullover, which just makes my heart swell with pride. So uh, Mike, I'll turn it over to you and I'll mute myself. Thanks, Dana. Uh, hello to everybody, and um, I can't tell you how, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that uh, I was able to reach out to Dana. I'm a big Dana fan because I'm into first impressions, and when I first met Dana, I knew she was a real deal, and she loved officials, and um, uh, when I came back for the, the clinic, um, meeting a lot of you, uh, it was it was really a joy, and it kind of brought me back to my roots to New Mexico because, as she said, land of enchantment is kind of dear to my heart. My mom still lives in Aztec, and um, I went up there after working the playoffs last year and saw her. And so, land of enchantment is dear to my heart. So, you know, I am wearing this hat and the pullover because, uh, I, you know, it's. It's true I'm still with Major League Baseball, but I came, I came from New Mexico, born and raised in New Mexico. I started my umpiring career in New Mexico, and um, that will never change. And I think that I've learned over my years uh, of just getting more mature and a little bit more wisdom that you have to give back, and, and you have to give back to the profession that has given me so much. And so real briefly, I, you know, I just retired from on-field umpiring. I had to make a very tough decision this past January. And um, I, I, after 21 years of, the, of umpiring on the major league field and 12 years in the minor leagues and uh, artificial hip and a few concussions, uh, we signed a new contract. And, and I thought, you know, uh, I think it, this might be happening for a reason. It's like knocking on the door and, and let, let's see. So I spoke with my wife, of course, and, and she, she uh, first of all said, that doesn't mean you're not gonna do anything, right? And of course, being 55 and being on the road as much as I am, I knew that wasn't gonna work. So Major League Baseball offered me a position as a supervisor. And so now, uh, 
my position, I started out uh, before all the, the virus uh, stuff started. I actually was in Arizona at spring training and I was observing AAA umpires. And um, I kind of, uh, I was just right in that transition of trying to figure out that next chapter of my life and supervising umpires. And listen, uh, when I first had my first game, um, as a supervisor, the guys walked out onto the field and I was in the press box. That had never happened to me in my entire career. And when I saw him walk onto the field, uh, I honestly had a little buyer's remorse. I, I thought, man, did I make the right decision? I should be down on that field with him. And um, so I watched, I got to watch probably 15 games um, and I watched all AAA umpires and uh, walking into the locker room and dealing with some of my former co colleagues. Um, I knew that this was going to be a challenge, but one of the things that I promised myself and others was that I would never forget how hard it is on the field. I think sometimes um, we can step away, and if you're in a position to supervise or, or great officials, sometimes you become – uh, a much better official when you're off the field or off the court. Um, and you sometimes have a tendency to forget how tough it is on the field. So I promised that to myself. I told my colleagues I would never do that. And um, if they, if I've, you know, if they saw me falling down that, um, that, that path that they were welcome to, um, um, you know, tell me about it and let me know, because I want to be a, a, a very strong advocate for, for umpires. But at the same time, I do realize that I'm working for the office now and, and I'm going to have to learn how to critique and give uh, feedback to my former colleagues on how to be a better umpire. So with all this happening, you know, as I see, as I told Dana and a few of you earlier, I've never, never heard about Zoom. I mean, uh, listen, and then I got on the administration side, and I've been on more Zoom calls in the past few weeks than I thought ever imaginable, you know. And, and so as I'm looking at everybody, someone told me, first of all, when you're doing this, you got to look at the camera, you know. And so I'm trying to learn this as I go. But as I look at everybody's faces and, um, you know, you can scroll through and look, I, I find that isn't it a strange time we're living in? I mean. Um, this is how we're staying connected. And thank God we can do that to try to stay connected and try to talk about things that uh, we really enjoy and try to try to keep connected with, with people. And I think one of the first things that I noticed about Dana was truly uh, she forms, she, she, she makes a great effort to form relationships. And I think that's one of her strong suits. And so that's what I, I'm trying to do as well. And I think that, that doing this, I, it, it's, it's the next, next best thing to, to seeing everyone live. But I want to stay involved with this. Um, I'm willing to, to, you know, do a clinic. I don't even know how I would do it. But I know one thing, I would put my heart and soul into it and we could talk about positioning and on plays. We, we could talk about handling situations. We could talk about anything that came to your mind. I would uh, uh, do the best I possibly could to try to make us all better. Um, as I told you in New Mexico, I don't have all the answers, but, but I do love the game and I do love uh, umpiring. And I think what the, the thing I really want to tell you is this. You know, I was thinking about this and – when you officiate, and we're talking about umpiring right now, um, a key word in that is persevering. You have to persevere because you're going to really be on the high sometimes. You're going to have some great games, and you're going to feel like you're just, just, wow, you're seeing the ball, you're seeing plays, you're dealing with situations, and then all of a sudden the bottom can fall out and you, you – you're struggling and you might be getting yelled at. I, I think, I think officiating umpiring is about perseverance, a big part of it. And 
Isn't that kind of what we're doing now? We're just persevering because we don't have, uh, we don't have the, the games to umpire. Um, it's kind of just taken from us. A lot of you, I'm sure, uh, were, was looking forward to a full schedule of games, um, not only financially, but for, for just wanting to do something you love to do. And we're going to have to persevere through that. Now, I will tell you at the major league level, what we're doing right now is um, there's 19 crews, and I'm in charge of four crews. So I keep in contact with those crews um, during the week. And on every Wednesday, we have a rules session. On Friday, the league sends out a rules test, and you take that online. And then Wednesday, the umpiring department meets in the morning, and we discuss uh, uh, different things and how the crews are doing. And then we all get on the Zoom call and we go through a test, which which goes rules and a new um, new addition this year is the addition of instant replay of announcing. Um, uh, Major League Baseball is having uh, umpires announce, pre-announce, and post-announce after they go to replay. For instance, uh, you have an out call at first base. Um, and Cincinnati's challenging. The crew chief will put on the headsets, pipe in, look up to the home, uh, uh, the home press box area, and will say since Cincinnati is challenging the out call at first base. Then he'll pipe in with replay. They will give him the uh, the result of the play. Then off the headset, he'll again look and go um, after review. The call is confirmed. The runner is out at first base. Cincinnati loses their challenge. Or you can go – so we also have instant replay training that we're doing per cruise every week. Um, and then another thing that the, the supervisor staff is doing is um, I'm watching a lot of minor league baseball games from last year. I'm watching AAA umpires um, on minor league baseball TV. I'm watching some AA umpires and just trying to identify some talent coming up to shoot. And it's really exciting. Um, I, I often tell some of the guys, I'm, I'm said, man, I'm so lucky they didn't have TV when I was umpiring because in the minor leagues, I don't know if I would have made it because these games, these AAA games and AA games are in high def. And, uh, you know, by Albuquerque, I'm watching quite a few games out of Albuquerque and Salt Lake and um, really watching some young umpires and able to identify with them. But there's one thing I'm really missing in that. And, and while this Zoom and all this technology we have is so great, I don't get to meet the individual, right? I don't get to go into the locker room and look into their eye and, and say, talk to them take them out to lunch. Um, I, I don't get that personal contact. And I think that's the, that's the thing that, that we always have to remember that, that while this is a great thing, it can't replace the actual contact you have on a personal basis. So, you know something, I, I, um, I'm excited. I was kind of thinking about this and, and I'm, I'm open for suggestions and I know you guys got speakers every Thursday, but as we go, Dana, I am available. I will make myself available. Hector, um, uh, if there's something that, that you think we can do to, to uh, make us all better, I am in, I am all in and um, I will do that. And, and I'm, I'm, really honored that you guys uh are here it's great to see all of you i uh i hope everyone is healthy and i know that through this as someone said uh right before we got on about the high school seniors i think i don't think i know this is going to make us better i know it's going to make us stronger um now listen i'm not going to kid i'm not i'm not you know hide here there are days, listen, I'm here at home. I've never been home here on April, in April. And so I got two kids and my wife and everyone's looking at each other at times going, what are you doing? And, and it's difficult. We're all having to persevere in different ways. I mean, you know, 
the, we got the internet problems. That's that's zoning out sometimes because I'm on Zoom. They're trying to do Zoom on school. Uh, but as I said, that word perseverance just keeps on coming up. And we're going to persevere through this. And we're going to be better because of it. But before that, we can do things to keep keep ourselves in tune with officiating umpiring. We can, we can get our heads in the rule book. We can do the, these kind of calls. We can try to do a clinic. There's so many things we can do. And um, I'm finding that out that, um, that, you know, while I'm wait while we're waiting on seeing what baseball is going to do and if we're going to get going again here, um, you know, this is a great opportunity to keep your head in the rule book, talk to each other, keep plugged into each other, and not only that, I mean, check in with one another. I mean, I think that's one of the good things that um, I'm able to do with my crews is I'm able to not only text them, but I'll call them. And I'll just say, how's everything going? And, um, hey, a lot of us are going through the same things, you know. It's, it's challenging at home. Uh, you don't know about the economic standpoint of getting paid at a certain point. Yeah, You've got yeah. the dynamic of kids. Uh, yeah. Um, relationships that to, you know that you're just having to uh, do your best to try to forge through so with that being said I wished I had this big webinar presentation that I could come out here and do right now I don't that was my presentation to tell you that I care and I want to help and if you guys have any questions I'll be be just happy to take them any question goes and I'll just leave it at that Mike, thank you. I'll, 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 I have a few to get going and, and give some guys uh, some time to come up with some questions. But uh, you said you started, uh, I think, umping here in New Mexico. Can you kind of give us, um, you know, uh, the leagues, the conferences that you worked and the process that you took, uh, you know, going all the way, all the way to the big leagues? Yeah, you know, something, as, as I said, I grew up in Aztec. And so um, when I was 12 years old, uh, first of all, I started playing when I was six. And I love the game of baseball and, and other sports. But uh, uh, when I was 12 years old, I was umpiring on a field. Uh, there was only three fields at Aztec. And, and so uh, my game got done and a guy came over and said, hey, we need an umpire for the eight-year-old game. And no one moved. And then they said, uh, for a hot dog and a Coke. And I ran over to the field and that was my first game I ever umpired, and I had no idea what I was doing, of course, but I stood behind the mound and, uh, uh, you know, uh, called, called the best I could, I guess, but I was more interested in hot dog and a Coke. But uh, that hot dog and a Coke kind of materialized into $5, and, um, you know, the next year, and then I kind of just took a liking to making $5, and I still love the game. So I continued to do that. And then, um, you know, I had aspirations of playing uh, college somewhere, but um, I quickly found out that uh, because of my lack of curve on my curveball, that was not going to happen. And so um, I went to New Mexico State. Um, I don't know if he's on this phone, but uh, uh, Mike Rundell, I met him at a, at a certain aspect, certain time of that at the intramural department. I kept on umpiring games and um you know something i just i was told that to kind of check into it kind of check into umpire school and i i did uh on the summers when i came home from college i would do basketball i love doing basketball i would do baseball just to make extra money but then i went to umpire school in 1987 um i uh, was fortunate enough to finish out of the top 20 out of the school Went to another school, competed against, uh, at that time there's two umpire schools, competed against those students. Longer story, longer, got placed in the minor leagues um, and started out my career in the Gulf Coast League. Went from the Gulf Coast League to the Midwest League, to the Eastern League, to the Texas League, to the uh, Pacific Coast League, and uh, worked, got called, uh, my first major league game in June 20th, 1996, and then got hired on full-time in 1999, and, and here we sat now. 
Awesome. Um, so can you tell us uh, a little bit about your greatest accomplishment as an umpire? And then a follow-up question to that is, can you tell us what you were doing uh, last year when you got the call to uh, that you were going to be the crew chief now when uh, Jeff Nelson went down uh, and how that whole process took place in New York? Yeah, um, so I think – uh, my biggest, I, it's, I think two accomplishments that I'm, I'm very proud of is first of all, this to, I hadn't completed my degree at New Mexico State and the joke at my house was uh, when I'd come home as my dad would say, how many more semesters? And I would say three. And finally, after coming home two summers in a row and saying three, that didn't carry too much water. And he said, what are you doing? And I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to coach and teach. Uh, that was my my dreams, but then um, when the umpire school came, um, uh, you know, came up and I looked into it, um, I went there kind of on a whim, on a dream. I didn't have my degree, and I think just doing that and looking back on it, it really made me uh, a little uh, stronger, just, just stepping out and doing it. And then the other thing is um, you know, I'll never forget uh, June 20th, 1996. That's the that's the time when I was uh, June 19th, 1996, I was in Salt Lake City. I had umpired a 15 inning game. Um, my, my career, I could see just the numbers weren't matching up and I, I didn't know how many years I had left because uh, you cannot be a career minor league umpire. And unbeknownst to me, a supervisor for the American League was there, Marty Springstead. Um, I ended up going 15 innings, had a couple ejections and uh, got back to the hotel room about two in the morning. And at that time we had answering machines and the American league called and said, you need to be in Oakland tomorrow. And, uh, this is your first major league game. And so that, that's definitely something that really, you know, stands out to me. June 20th, 1996, the score was two to nothing. It lasted two hours and 41 minutes and I had the plate and that was that's something I'll never forget. On the other question about the uh, playoffs last year, I would have never thought that uh, that was going to be my last game on the field or last series because I wasn't planning on retiring. It was in the back of my mind, but we hadn't signed a new contract. Um, I had I had got called uh, two years before I had had hip replacement, so I missed most of the season. And uh, – 2018 uh, was a difficult season for me, but I made it through the entire season without missing any days. Um, and, you know, my back was causing me some problems, but <clears throat> I made it through it, persevered. And um, so in 2020, um, I was asked to, uh, you know, I was asked just quite uh, frankly by one of our bosses, hey, how much, at the end of the year, they just said, how much gas you got left in your tank? And I said, you know something, I, I, I've got a little left. And so if you need, if, if you need me, I'm here to use me. Now, I didn't really think that, that he would say at this point, he said, well, I need you to work the one game playoff behind the plate, uh, Washington and Milwaukee, the National League wildcard game. But that's the one he asked me to work. So I went and worked it. And I thought I was done. After, at that, uh, I thought that my season had been completed. So I actually traveled back to Aztec saw my mom, saw my sister, and really unplugged from the game. Came back to Des Moines and um, uh, minding my own business on a nice fall day, walking the dog and kind of just having even unpacked my equipment box, but I just disengaged from the game. And um, I left my phone on the counter and I came back after a walk and my phone was practically hopping off the counter just vibrating and uh, just a bunch of notices. And I'd got a call from Mr. Joe Torrey. He was in New York and, and Jeff Nelson had gotten hit. And um, I knew what was going on then because the TV was on and uh, I said, wow. And so, you know, so Joe said, hey, we need you to come to New York. We need you to finish out this series. And I'm sorry, but that's just, we, we've got to have a crew chief here. And um, so that's kind of how that worked out. Um, I ended up going in and working games four 
and game five, and then we traveled to Houston, uh, worked game six, and I was scheduled to work game seven behind the plate. But uh, fortunately, it ended in six. One of my, one of my regrets that I, I'm having a hard time erasing from my head, and, and that's just because uh, the human aspect is I missed a play on my last game ever as a major league umpire, and it got flipped in instant replay. And for whatever reason, that really bothered me. But at the end of the day, um, you know, something that's not, that's not how I remember my career, of course. And I would venture to say, you know, uh, that that's one of my downfalls, to be honest with you, is that I, I, I try to get that word perfection. And when, even when I don't, I really battle with that. And as I try to talk to younger umpires, um, I really think we struggle with that anxiety of trying to be perfect. Um, and instant replay can really, really fix that in a hurry. And it's one of those things that I really want to try to help out with the younger umpires, especially to just, uh, to just, you go out, you work your game to the best of your ability and there's no one going to be perfect, you know? And so some seasons you're going to have, 10 misses some seasons you're going to have three misses but in the overall that's 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 not how you gauge your entire season as you got as as all of you uh, ladies and, and men here know that's not how we gauge our season it's in the whole the whole totality of the season um how you handle situations uh you know there's just a number of things so anyway i didn't mean to ramble too much Hector, on that that's that's a question there no, no, I, thank you. I, I love it. Um, I have a couple more, but I'll, uh, other people have questions too. So Dana, go ahead. So Mike Everett, I, uh, Nate in our office, he and I started thinking about officials that we have in the, in the major leagues, in the professional leagues, and we started doing a hunt for your records, and I want you to know that we found them. So here's your basketball which you actually did a year longer than baseball. And here's your baseball. So um, I, I was a little bit disappointed at your clinic attendance. And I just want everybody to know that even though he didn't go, they're still really, really important. Um, so your, your first year was 1984 and you paid $20 to be a baseball umpire here in the state of New Mexico. And uh, you started basketball the same year um, you moved a lot because everything, this was our high tech that we still use, by the way, and everything's crossed out. But one of the things we're going to do is the next time I see you, Nate and I want you to sign these, and we're actually going to start a little display at the NMOA Hall of Fame for our professional officials, and we want you to sign these, and we're going to frame them and uh, put them in our office because certainly your accomplishments having started here and going on into the majors is, is something we're, we're very proud of and uh, we'll want that on display. So the next time I see you, have a, have a Sharpie so I can have you sign these. Mine was more of a lighthearted, just a show and tell that we keep everything in the NMAA office. Well, <laughs> and, and that, Mike, that, that's impressive, Dana. That's very <laughs> impressive. Mike, I, I'd be is, glad to sign it. As you know, as officials, you don't get to sign very many things. So I mean... <laughs> I mean, that's an autograph for an umpire, I'll, absolutely, anytime. Usually it's just ejection and, report, so. And, <laughs> that's it, that's and, it. And, and Mike, I usually am the, the person that uh, looks at uh, officials' ratings, and I must say I did cringe when I saw your uh, clinic attendance. <laughs> well, I was very young then, Nate, so, I mean, you know, I, I just did what I – and plus I'll just blame it on Paul Laporte and uh, Mike Rundell. There you go. Uh, let's see, Mike, we have uh, Todd is asking, uh, what do you consider a couple of the most unique or unusual plays calls you have been involved in? Well, you know, so I, I, this is a great question because when I think of that, uh, I was just telling uh, some official, well, I was telling a, a young guy, I, I watched it uh, spring training that I kind of watched work for the first time and he's really young and I kind of liked what I saw, but I, I talked to him and I said, I said, um, I think what you're going to find in your career is that you learn the most by things you mess up. Um, 
because that's the really, truly the only way we, not the only way, but it, it, it is my fact. I think if we're honest with each other, that's how we learn about it because, you know, we miss a play or we miss a rule or, and I'll give you one example. And it was one of the most embarrassing times I've had on a major league field. Um, uh, we had runners on first and second infield fly situation. I'm at second. And um, the ball is popped up, and it's a question whether, and I'm working second base, and it's a question whether it's high enough to be called an infield fly. And it was called an infield fly, but the runners were running all over the place, and the ball was thrown to second, and he was touching the bag at second. He was tagging the runner uh, and then throwing the ball around. And, and, and truly, I mean, I was like safe, out, say, I mean, I was – my mind, I wasn't prepared. And so in that particular play from then on, um, after we unscrambled and got out of that situation that I, I, that I really messed up, I, I would always say, and I always say, uh, infield fly situation, not a force, got to tag them. Infield fly situation, not a force, got to tag them. That's it. A learning thing that I I do in my mind, you know, um, infield fly if fair, not a force, got to tag them. Meaning, you know, the runners aren't forced. So that just kind of teaches me even to this day, the last year when I'm still umpiring. So any play that I mess up, or or uh, um, a rule interpretation or a, a positioning play where I look and I just go, you know. Man, that was not the position I wanted to be in. Or uh, sometimes um, uh, I can look back on my career, and early on in my career I had a hot head, and um, um, I, would, uh, I would go right to ejecting before dealing with the situation. And I think that um, over time and with mentors, uh, I learned how to deal with uh, situations a little bit better. Um, and so I think that's kind of the, kind of the things I, I, I look back on, but, um, um, the one play I will say in particular, the, that, uh, that I had in 2003, uh, it was my first, um, league championship series assignment and the Chicago Cubs were five outs away from going to the world series. And I was working the left field line minding my own business and just uh you know i think work game three four five i don't know game four in miami then five and then it's game six and uh, it was electric at wrigley field in chicago and the pot you know the fly ball went up to left field and lo and behold there's a fan grabbing it and there's a player trying to catch it and i was a left field umpire and I had to determine whether that was fan interference in it or not. I said it wasn't. And um, I thought there was going to be a big argument. It ended up all the attention went to uh, Steve Bartman. And uh, that was the Steve Bartman game. And, and I was left unscathed as an official. Had the attention went directly towards me, my career had been totally different. And there's pretty good possibility – I would not be on this Zoom call with you right now um, because that could have really changed the trajectory of my career. But having said that, uh, as, a, as we talked about plays, it would have taught me something. And, and, and it did teach me this, that sometimes I have a bad habit of moving on plays and it wasn't completely set. And um, while I think I still got it right, Occasionally, when I see it on TV, it still makes me cringe a little bit. So, oh, you kind of talked a little bit about um, you know dealing with coaches and players. Uh, as you you know became a mature, mature umpire, experienced umpire, what can you tell us you know here now at the high school level? on, uh, you know, different tools that we could use uh, to deal with, you know, uh, coaches. Um, and also, uh, which uh, coach or player do you, that you can remember, uh, you know, gave you probably, you know, the, 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 the hardest time, I guess, or, you know, just uh, 
on a play that happened, uh, which play or coach or player do you remember? Well, Hector, here's the deal on the, the, the player or player or manager. Um, I often get asked this, and I'll, I'll just put it this way. I still work for Major League Baseball, and in today's world, I just can't comment on specific players or managers. But, um, you know, I will say that, that early on in my career, um, you know, I think it's this way in, in officiating a lot, to be honest with you. It takes they, – they, they need to see you walk out onto that field or that diamond a number of times and get to know you. And when you're young or just starting out, um, uh, they're going to test you a little bit. And um, I knew that going on early in my career, especially in professional baseball, that, um, you know, you had to stand up and you, you – hey, when you had two umpires in um, – a ball going against 50, 25 on one side and 25 on the other, um, you know, you had to stand up and, and you had to learn how to deal with situations. And I think that's what the minor leagues really does is help you learn and, and teach you how to deal with situations. Now, I will tell you this, that, that of course, um, uh, as I got more games under my belt and I got more mentoring from other umpires on how to handle things differently, um, then, then I had to determine. I mean, I got called by supervisors, and, and I had to meet with some people, and they said, hey, listen, Mike, you know, here's a deal. You know, uh, we can get anybody here to, to come on the field, and the first person that yells and, and you yell back and then eject them, I mean, that's easy. Now, now the hard part is coming. You're, you're going to have to deal with this, and you're going to have to, you're gonna have to uh, run your game a little bit differently. And so that was a difficult time, but at the same time, it, it taught me that, um, number one, I don't have to react to everything. Um, early on in my career, I reacted to everything. That pitch is low, and uh, my, my head would whip right over and say, no, that pitch is not low. You know something? Um, as I've got to know managers and coaches and players, I don't really think they, sometimes it's personal, but they're really not mad at Nate or Hector or, or you know, Bill or anybody. They, they, they get tied up in the game and they want to they, they wanna win, they want to succeed. Um, so anyway, I, my, my, one of my first things is I, I quit reacting to everything I heard, unless it was, something that really got my attention. And um, if it got my attention, then I would even then try to do, it sounds crazy, but I'd do a little breathing exercise. And I would just, you know, I'd say to myself, and sometimes verbally loud, I'd go in through the nose, out through the mouth. And then it came to a point where I'd go, Ah, uh, in through the nose, out with a crap. And for whatever reason, that just helped me calm me down that split second. Because at that time, it seemed like a bunch of crap. But after I let it go, it was gone, and I had to concentrate on the next pitch or play, and it became nothing. So uh, I often would do breathing exercises. I didn't do that until probably my 14th or 15th year in the big leagues because that was, uh, that, that was a little crazy to even talk about. But I think breathing exercises help. I think actually uh, one, one thing was that they come out and argue before replay. If they are screaming at you, if you talk really soft, usually it gets their attention. Not all the time, but then they start wondering, you know, they, they're trying to listen to you and you're talking softly, so it takes the edge off a little bit. So those are two things that I, that I work on, but um, they don't always work, but that's, that's a couple that I work on. Awesome. Uh, let's see, we have uh, 
Samba, uh, Stephen Swift uh, is asking, did you use a certain technique or method to master the rules or now as a supervisor, do you teach a, a method? Well, great question. So I think that each one of us have a uh, strength. Um, like, you know, on my crews, um, I would always know who my go-to guy was on rules or go-to person. Hey, listen, I think God wires us all a little bit different. And um, uh, some guys, some ladies, I mean, they just know the rules in and out. And then there's some people, some officials who really can can they work their way around it and then they can they can improvise a little bit and make it work out on the field. And I think as a crew, that is one of the greatest things. You have different talents on each crew and you hopefully get to work with one another enough that you can utilize those, those talents. Um, as far as the rules, um, I, I was always a pretty good rules person and I, and, but, um, it's not my ultimate strength. So I'm really having to work. I really had to work hard at the rules. Um, but we would always on our crews, we would talk about rules pre and post game. Um, uh, you know, on off days, if we were together, we would pick one out of the rule book and talk about it. Um, as a supervisor, um, listen, as I told you, I think one of the things that I told that I made a point to tell all the umpires before all this, the coronavirus came out that I'm going <clears> to <throat> get back with them when we get going is just because I'm a supervisor does not make me, you know, any better than I was on the field. The fact of the matter is I'm the same guy. I'm same. my name's still Mike Everett. Yes, I'm a supervisor. I'm not on the field with you. I'm not, I don't know it all. And you're going to teach me. I'm going to teach you. And, and like I said earlier, that one of my main things is I don't want to become a Hall of Fame umpire the minute I walk off the field because it's easy to go, fall into that <clears throat> because you're not out on that field and you don't have to react to situations. You're looking at it from a different perspective. You're seeing two, three times on a camera. And so as far as rules, you know, Rule book, we have a rule book, we have a manual, and we have a replay manual. And I think I shared this with at the at the clinic. It's impossible to know those in and out. It's impossible. Now, the more you get in it and the more you discipline yourself to get into that every day and read portions of that and try to teach it, and then at the same time admit to others that, hey, I, I don't understand that. Or, you know, that's not my interpretation of that. I think that's what makes you a better official. Got it. Uh, let's see. Uh, any pointers on getting the call correct on close place as a base umpire on second or third base? Is that just any plays or just are you just not you're talking any just plays in general? Uh, yeah, I guess in general, Terrence, if you can uh, let us know if that's your question, just in general, or uh, yeah, that's what he asked. Well, so, um, you know, I think there's a number of things that, that I constantly uh, battled with and tried to as an umpire, even, you know, working myself through the minor leagues and to the major leagues. Anytime I felt myself struggling or questioning myself, uh, pre-replay or post-replay, I could always come back to probably two things, but one thing was timing. And anytime I was struggling, it was always because my timing was too quick. Um, so timing is a huge, uh, a huge part of, of officiating period and umpiring. But then I also look at my angles on a play and I realize, you know, as I'm watching and remembering back working two, two man mechanics versus three versus four, that all changes. But my distance from plays, if I was getting too close to a play and it was exploding, then I would always say back off the play a little bit 
get more distance and take that extra half second or split second and it seems like a lot, but it's not, and process the play. So I will always, you know, I was taught that early on, you know, it's like it's a big picture, you know, and if I back off, I see more picture, and if I get too close, then sometimes that can explode, explode on me. So I would say distance and timing are the, the two big factors in, in helping you get plays correct. Um, repetition is huge. And also, um, you got to be lucky. You got to be lucky some, some out there. And so um, I, I, would, I would stick with those two. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. Um, someone's asking, how much does uh, Major League Baseball umpires help umpires that are older? And what can we take from it that will help us be better umpires? So, Hector, could you repeat that one more time, brother? Yeah. How, how does the uh, uh, Major League Baseball umpires help umpires that are already older uh, and what can umpires here in this session take from uh, what, will, what will help us be better umpires? Well, I, I, th I think, you know, I think, first of all, um, wanting to learn. I mean, you, you've got to want that. And, of course, here we are sitting here going over just talking about, uh, I think the more you talk about umpiring, the more you talk about the game the better chance you're going to have to learn um, being engaged with that um, you know thinking about this also is is really sometimes hard but being able to accept constructive criticism and also knowing how to give out constructive criticism um, and I think that's is, you know through time and getting to know your partners and I often say this, um, I would much rather have someone come into the locker room and say, Mike, you know, I noticed this play at the plate. You had a great angle or you had a great instinct on this one play or, uh, you know, I really like your mechanics. Uh, you really look good in the uniform. So what I'm saying is start out with something positive little positive reinforcement because we all have something that's positive. And then you can kind of go into, Hey, let's talk about that play at second base. What, uh, you know, what, what do you see there? Would you, do you think you got a good look at that? Or actually getting out the, you know, getting out the board and, and, and actually, which I'm really excited about hopefully doing it sometime with you guys is maybe doing, you know, having something up on the board and talking about plays at second base or the plate and rotating with a play and, and getting that perfect angle, you know, that, that you know in your mind you've sought 100%. So um, I think, you know, listen, I, there was a time in my career, I'll, I'll share with you real quick. In, in 1990, I think it was 1997, um, I was still in AAA, and I was, uh, I was going up and down between AAA and the big leagues. I went to the AAA season was over and I got called up and I was in Detroit. I had the plate. It was getaway day. The game lasted 15 innings and I had five ejections. Five. I had three from the Tigers, two from the Angels. It was absolutely, these are times where now we're talking about it, another time where I can learn from things. Everything was going great till the seventh inning, and then there was a check swing, and then he, he wouldn't leave the area, so I ended up ejecting him. It was a domino effect. Five ejections later, it was getaway day. Long story short, I called my wife, and I said, I'm coming home, and I think, it's, I think my career is over. Um, Marty Springstead was the uh, supervisor. He believed in me, and he started out by saying, man, kid, I really liked how you were calling strikes. I really like how you took control of the situation. And then, and, then, and then he stopped and he goes, but after you fill out all those ejection reports, you call me back and we're going to go over a few things. 
So what he did to me is he told me he believed in me. He believed in me, but I was going to have to start working on a few things. So another thing he did is instead of just keeping me down for the rest of the season, there was a season, there was a week left in the major league season. He sent me to Richard, uh, Richie Garcia. And I had to work three play jobs that week, but Richie Garcia took me under the wing and <clears throat> as a major league umpire, I'll never forget it showing up to Chicago White Sox dressing room. And he put a towel on the ground and he said, that's the plate. And he made one of the other umpires, young um, umpire, be the catcher. And he said, show me your stance. And so here I am, you know, scared to death anyway, but I, I okay, showed him my stance. And he started working with me on my stance. He said, I think you're getting blocked out here on, on pitches. I need you to do this. I need you to change your mechanic. Uh, and so that was a turning point in my career. And I think each one of us can help, uh, uh, help one another with those kind of things. But you have to make sure that you know that when you're talking to that official or another person that they know you believe in them. You believe in them. And then you can start working on, uh, on other stuff. Awesome. Hope you have a couple. Uh, you have minutes for a few more, Mike. We have a couple more. Absolutely. Okay. I, uh, Dana, I only charge. I don't know if we went over this. But I, I'm really cheap. I think we can afford it, right, Dana? Is it is it per question or what are we what are we doing? <laughs> it's all good. Let's, let's send, see. Send, um, me your, send me your invoice. <laughs> uh, it's a hot dog and a coke, right? There you go. Hot dog and a coke. There you go. Or is five dollars. <laughs> is it beneficial to attend pro camp just to learn even if you are too old to be picked up as a pro umpire? Um, sure. I, listen, I, when I went to umpire school, there was 150 students. And I would venture to say out of the 150, there were probably, I would probably say 100 at that year, 1986, 87. <clears throat> that we're really trying to uh, become major league umpires. You know, there's a lot of, lot of people who go to, to uh, uh, umpire school because they want to be better uh, local umpires and want to be better, or they want to, uh, you know, try to be college umpires. Um, listen, I could go to a clinic right now and, and, and make myself better. Um, I'm even taking a class online on how to be uh, management skills because that's that's the area that I'm going into and you know and I, sadly to say they don't really have a training program for supervisors hopefully maybe we can get one going but um, Dana's strong suit I would say probably is managing people and so yes I would say go if you can to clinics and if you want and take the things that work for you and other things just don't work for each individual or each different but absolutely those clinics and 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 sessions like that can make you a better umpire awesome um let's see uh heck can, can i jump in here <laughs> real quick <clears throat> sorry just as a guy that went to pro school when he was 50 uh i had no aspirations of getting a job but I think as older umpires, the more we learn and the more we can bring back and come back to our groups with the heart of a teacher and share that knowledge, you know, and anything we can learn and share makes the entire group better and stronger. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Mike, uh, let's see, can you ask uh, about swipe tags at first or second base? What is the best mechanic that you can recommend? For swipe tags? Correct. Um, I don't know if there's a mechanic per se, unless I'm misunderstanding the question. <clears throat> I think swipe tags, are really becoming quite uh, 
you know, the common, pretty common nowadays because how players are uh, pretty cute at doing their slides um, and how they're being taught how to do their slides. I think, I think swipe tags for umpires are all about positioning. And for instance, I was, here's another thing that, that comes to my mind about, uh, um, it could turn into a swipe tag, but I'm working first base. An umpire was once asked, what's your hardest play? And that umpire who's still umpiring now that has bazillion games says, my next play. And when he said that, I went, it makes sense. It's always your next play. You always have to guard against your next play because some of your most wide open plays that look wide open, they become your nastiest plays. And I once had an umpire, I was struggling with some uh, plays at first base and he was watching it from third base. And he said, why don't you try this? I think what you're doing is you're sticking with the ball too long. So I would, a ground ball would hit the shortstop. I would get my angle. I would try to get my distance. And then as soon as the ball was released, then I would hone in on the first baseman's foot and the bag. I would not follow as soon as that ball was released, and I knew it was released to first base, then I would hone in on the base and the foot because the foot was going to tell me if that was going to be a, pu a pure throw or a wild throw. If it was a bad throw, that, that first baseman's feet is going to start, he's going to start moving. And at that time, that's when I can move and adjust my angle on a play that's going to turn into a swipe tag, if that makes any sense. Same thing on a swipe tag at the plate. At the major league level, I, a lot of it is turning into, uh, you know, we were always taught uh, umpire school at yeah, the point of the plate. You go to the point of the plate, and that's where you stood. Well, as plays started developing, that's fine to be at the point of the plate if you have a collision play or that play, that, that tag that's right there at that corner of the plate. But if you've got catchers reaching out, to right field, reaching out to right field and then coming across their body and the catch, the, the runner is sliding to the back corner of the plate, then you're not going to have a good look if you just continue to stay at the point of the plate. You're going to have to move towards third baseline extended so you can see that swipe tag and have distance and timing and see that play more clearly. As far as the as far as the mechanic Hector, I don't I don't know exactly what you know. I don't think there's a mechanic for swipe tag. Okay, um, let's see. I have two more. I got. I'm getting questions here on all kinds of questions, uh, places, Mike. So bear with me here. Uh, okay. Can you can you tell us a little bit about your daily routine as a MLB umpire when you get to a four game series or a three game series. Uh, can you just kind of take us through your day and like, if it's a weekend series of, you know, what you do as a crew and things like that? Sure. So um, very rarely do they have four game series now. I mean, well, I, I guess they're coming back a little bit, but usually it's three games and, um, <clears throat> and two game series, which are really tough. But it kind of the series kind of revolve around your travel, and so I, I have found I found that that that's the most challenging aspect of, of our job. At, as as I got older, was travel. So, for instance, um, <clears throat> I start off. We start off our week. We have a three game series in New York which is, can happen, you have a three-game series in New York, a Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday afternoon game, and then you have a Thursday off. But if you usually have that Thursday off, you're going to be going to the West Coast. They're going to be flopping or, or moving people around. So 
you, you, you work that afternoon game and you determine, you know, if what part of the season it is. And if you can, you get home on Wednesday night to flip in there and, and, and see your family or just get off the road for one night. But then Thursday you're going to – or Wednesday night or Thursday, travel to the West Coast, get, in, get into town and, and get a good night's sleep. But your, your three-game series would start on Friday and you would normally – each guy's different. Um, you know, as I got older, I'd wake up earlier, so I couldn't sleep in. Some guys like to sleep in, get their rest. Uh, but I got in a habit where, you know, you get up, have a little breakfast, take a walk. Um, I was a big walker. And so walk, get a little workout in, have a lunch. Um, some guys take a little nap before then. But then we were always at the ballpark. We'd show up, you know, two hours before and then travel down to the ballpark. Um, it did kind of be like, you know, right now I would consider this Groundhog Day what we're going through. It it's, can be like that. Our season can be like that as well. But the, the deal is, you know, the night games followed by a day game, followed by a travel day um, and travel being pretty difficult. And then in and out of the airports, in and out of the hotels, time zone changes, um, that, that, that becomes pretty demanding. Um, but uh, rest is a huge thing um, because uh, it, it catches up with you in a hurry. And then some, some nights, you know, as we know, those, uh, <clears throat> those quick games turn into extra innings and, uh, you know, things you can't control. But each person's a little bit different. Some crews like to meet for lunch. Some crews don't. Um, we would always meet once a week and, and, and just talk about our families. Uh, uh, but when we got to the ballpark, we like to play cards. Uh, we like to play, you know, spades or hearts or something. <clears throat> but when it was about 45 minutes, it depend on who would work the plate, then, then it was done. Your cards were done and then you were getting ready for the game and, you know, kind of getting your head ready and um and and getting ready to work the game awesome okay we got two more mike if that's okay all good uh let's see you have seen and worked over the years with umps who reached only low minor league ball or only college or even only high school ball what have you seen from mlb umpires that they do to continue improving to the very highest level that umps at much lower levels do not? Um, you know, some, well, first of all, I mean, not everybody wants to be a major league umpire. I mean, they, that's not, you know, that, that's not their mindset or their dream. And so, you know, you take that out of the equation. Um, but, you know, something I – I, so I have a 15 year old boy and um, a 20 year old daughter, but my, my son plays sports. And so even when I go watch him, I'm really, I really, I can't get my, I keep my eyes on the officials and um, I, I just, you know, watch them and see how they do things. And I always try to, you know, go compliment them or just encourage them or say great job. And um, so I don't think it's necessarily what they don't do. You know, you know, some, some, some people don't want to, they, they're fine doing uh, uh, high school ball or uh, little league or, or, you know, AAU or whatever circuit they're doing. Um, but I think if, if you're serious about wanting to get better at whatever, whatever league you are at or whatever level you're at, at, then that's where all of this we're talking about. And I'm sure that you've attended clinics and talked to other officials. You, you, you have to study the rules. You have to be confident you know the rules. You have to learn how to deal with people. You have to love kids. Uh, you have to love the game. And, and there's nothing more enjoyable so far even, even when I was umpiring, when I watched a game and I could see someone enjoying what they're doing. And I had a major league umpire tell me this one time. 
because uh, I was feeling bad about myself and I'd missed a few plays and travel was bad and I hadn't been home. And he said, you know something? You better change your attitude. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He says, it shows out on the field. He said, even when you don't want to be there, you need to act like you want to be there. And there are some days in whatever job we're doing, we don't want to be there. That's human. But, man, it's fun to watch somebody out on the field that has joy in what they're doing because it, it, it's contagious. It's contagious. And, and I love seeing it, especially from younger umpires, because they're on fire because they just they love it. And even on their bad days, they seem like they love it. Awesome. So, uh, Dana, do you want to ask him the last question or you want me to ask him? I think uh, I think Jim should unmute himself. Let me un you know what I'm gonna unmute him and let him ask the question. You're on oh. Jim, you're there. unmuted. There we go. Hey Mike Everett, Jim Sayer. Um went to school at NMSU about the same time you did. They call you shooter. I see Mike down at the bottom now. But my last question is uh, did you ever finish your degree at NMSU? Yeah. Jim, and by the way, thanks for bringing up Shooter because, you know, that's a, that's a story in itself. Uh, I got to tell you quickly how Shooter happened. Uh, and, and then, well, I'll get right to the point. I didn't. I didn't get my degree at New Mexico State. Uh, I, that's one of my I, – I think that's something I want to do at some point. And so I retired at a 55. So I think I can do that. Now, I don't know if I have that uh, discipline to do it. But one, do, one thing I do do, you know, I, I played in the band at New Mexico State, so I picked up my trumpet a little bit more. And anytime the neighbors have a birthday, I'm taking it out there playing. So, you know, you know, Jim, maybe next time I get out the trumpet, play the Aggie fight song. You and, you know, some of us can be happy and the Lobos can be sad. So, <laughs> insane. <laughs> what was the first part of your question, Jim? I forgot. <laughs> it was just that. Oh, shooter. Listen, I got to tell you this quick story about Shooter. So I'm working with this guy in AAA. His name is Ron Barnes. And um, Ron Barnes was a longtime minor league umpire, and he went up and down between the big leagues in AAA. And uh, he, he was a character. I mean, there's so many characters you meet within the game but in life, but this guy was a character. And anyway, I worked with him for two years, three years. But the second year – he kept on calling me a different name every series. You know, it was Jim. It was, hey, Don. It was – I'm like, Ron, it's Mike. It's Mike. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, Mike. Never could get it right. And then the clincher was, uh, you know, I, I was dating my wife now, but she came in, and she's fairly tall, and she, he couldn't remember her name. And finally he said, your name is Tall Drink of Water. And I said, well, then what's my name? Because you can't remember my name. And he goes, from now on, your name is Shooter. So that's how that, that worked out, Jim. I always wondered where that came from. <laughs> yeah. Now Long I answer. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, Mike, I, I, unless anybody else has any more questions, nobody else send me anything. Um, I just want to thank you for taking the time to uh, join us tonight. And, uh, you know, we'll do it again. Like I said, uh, until we uh, get back in the field, uh, hopefully sometime this summer, uh, we're going to do this every Thursday night. So we will definitely have you on again. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for uh, your time and answering your questions and all your information. Hector, I appreciate it. Dana, thank you so much. Please keep me in mind and I'll reach out. Maybe we can do like a, some type of clinic. We can do plays. We can do rules, we can talk, whatever, but um, <clears throat> I just want to let you guys know that, and, and ladies know that, first of all, I love New Mexico. Thank you, I Mike. love New Mexico. It will always be home to me. Um, of course, some of us are Aggies and some of us are Lobos and vice versa, but uh, it's, a, it's a place where I always call home. And um, listen, when I came to the clinic a couple of years ago, it was just, uh, it was a time I'll never forget, Dana, really. It really, it really touched my heart. And it's, when I saw that, you posting that, I just felt like reaching out to you. I, I just think you're a tremendous person. You've got a tremendous group. 
you take time to forge relationships. And I really think at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. Well, so thank, thank you, you, Mike. And thanks, Mike, again. Um, and I'd like to give a special thank you to Mike Rendell, who is on the call. Mike is kind of who first connected Mike Everett and I with each other. And uh, I think Mike and I pretty much were fast friends. It was pretty easy for us to make that connection and really uh, realize we're the same kind of people for sure. So I really do appreciate Mike Rendell making that initial introduction and bringing Mike Everett back into the New Mexico family and certainly the NMOA family. And uh, Hector, thanks for letting us take over your, uh, your planned webinar. I knew you wouldn't mind at all. Um, I've been getting texts as this is going on and everybody's just loving what, you know, what you're offering to us tonight, Mike, and we really do appreciate that. But we'll keep you involved and uh, we'll talk. Hector and I'll have some conversations and we'll uh, get some other individuals in the fold to plan some clinics and some other instructional educational stuff on baseball and uh, continue these as long as as long as we need to and as long as we can. Um, it's so good to see your face, Mike, and uh, I, I really do appreciate you reaching out and to the umpires on the call. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your evening once again to talk baseball. I know everybody's missing it, and I. I definitely see it in your faces and it, it hurts my heart to know you're not doing what you what you love but I certainly do appreciate you being on here and uh, listening to what Mike had to say and taking notes and uh, Mike you're making all of us better so thank you so much. Amen. See you Ron. Bye-bye. Bye. See you guys. Hey Mike thanks for doing this man appreciate it. Oh anytime my pleasure. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate yeah, everybody. it. God bless, everybody. Stay safe. God bless you as well. Be safe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Kill me. Hector, do you want to stay on for a bit? Is anybody going to stay and talk? Or? I'm here. Hey, Dana, Hector, thank you so I'm much for Francisco, letting the guy here. from Indiana be a part of this tonight. You bet. Thanks, Michael. You're yep. welcome to join anytime. I will do that. Hey, I do. Wish, are you going to be on there later so we can talk to Blackhawks? No, probably not. All right. Hey, can I ask you a quick question, Dana? Yes. You are, you're just killing it. Football, basketball, baseball, webinars. Are, I'm you not more busy, are you more busy than usual right now? I sure hope not. <laughs> I kind of feel like it. It's been weird. Um, luckily, I've really been just getting information from other people and sending it out. So I, I'm glad I have internet and I can still figure out how to email. Um, but, you know, the football guys have been awesome getting speakers and uh, <laughs> basketball. Nate, of course, kind of started all of that. And, you know, Hector started these for baseball and having Mike Everett come to me and ask if he could speak to you guys. I was like, gee. Gee, let me think about it. So I sent Hector a text right away, and I really had to twist his arm for him to, you know, let yeah, Mike right. be on here. But uh, right. it, it's been, you know, I'm just glad that you guys are having the opportunity to to see each other and still talk baseball while you can't be out on the field. I think this is so important still. Um, but I, I love seeing you all, and it really it keeps me going more than you know. So I really do appreciate being included and involved in it. You are making a lot of good things happen, Dana, as always. Well, thank you. It's not definitely not me. It's everybody else, and I'm just uh, I'm just the keeper of information and disseminator of information, and uh, I I love doing it. So thank you. This is nice thank to you, talk to human beings. Two thousand views by this time next Thursday. Jim, how are things in California? Uh, we hit 90 degrees today. It's oh. We're doing good. All weekend long, it's going to be in the 90s, and then it goes down to the 70s uh, during the week. So we're waiting for the 70s to come back. Jim Sayer, we miss you. I know. I, you can tell it's baseball season. I'm actually... I'm actually growing and some uh, a worm and stuff with, like that up on oh, my my text here. Whether it's on the field or uh, but or yeah, I, I miss New Mexico. It's, it's great. Um, it needs to be uh, but it's great out here also. I've had plenty of opportunities. Uh, my high school I've gone to zero. Um, that are more of the more so deep one um, stuff, and stuff. But I did get to work at Dodger Stadium last year. The first seven days are free. 
I, I that was pretty cool. The same thing with Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. My kids, yeah. I get notifications all the time. Well, it's, anyway, it's I'm going to sign chat, off. Said, even though I'm thanks for joining us, Jim. Yeah. Hector, keep me posted. I'm going to try to do as much as possible. Yes, sir. Every every time. Y'all be careful. Okay, bye. Bye. Unless you got 80 bucks to give me. Okay, I'll give it to you. All right, I'm gonna sign off. Do you guys need to? Do you guys want me to keep it on, or? I won't see it anyway. But you're in the first time. Anybody? Do you guys? Anybody have any questions at all? Uh, <laughs> Five to nothing. Six to nothing. Eight. Three you get. You give me another idea, Scott, for our next. Richard, you got any questions, brother? We'll have another think tank kind of thing on the platform. Resume building 101. Um, there's a lot of us that are that are. Dana, I think we're good. Okay. Salt in her hair and the ladder. Thank, Thank you so much. The Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your night, and I'll uh, see you see you next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks, Dana. Thanks so very much. Take care. Good night, y'all. It's all about the community, helping the community.